For those of you who don't know me, my name is Daniel Almeida. I work for Colabra. I'm Brazilian. I was here last year also discussing um, Codex and Video for Linux and how exactly we can use Rust for that. Um, so yes, just a, a, a brief recap of what the problem is. Just uh, believe me when I say that in order to decode video using, I'm sorry, in order to decode video using a hardware accelerator, um, let, let's say an H.264 file using a hardware decoder, this hardware decoder will have to ingest a whole bunch of untrusted data from user space. Just believe that, because otherwise we would take too long to explain this. And the, the current issue is that nowadays we have a very um, ad hoc, let's say, um, validation process in the kernel. So basically the validation process is going through the specification PDF and seeing whether some data have bound, uh, bounds on it and manually implementing these checks in C. And of course that's, that does not cover like literally all the cases, right? It's a best effort um, kind of approach. So last year I was talking to Mauro and Hans and other people and I was also here trying to maybe see whether we could write a whole driver in Rust. Let's write a decoder driver in Video for Linux using, using Rust and how, uh, whether this is possible. And this was met uh, with a little bit of pushback. And the reason there was pushback was basically, um, if you will remember um, from, from also from, from, uh, from Wetson, he, 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 he linked to a presentation where people were also asking about the layer of bindings and how this layer of bindings would actually work, who would have to maintain that. If we change something in the C code and we have a binding in Rust for that, who will make sure to update that? You see, that's a real problem. We had people um, talking about Coxnell um, today as a way to maybe um, bridge this gap. So for the video for Linux people, this was a little bit of too much of an, uh, of an unknown for them to proceed with a full driver, a full codec driver in Rust, basically. Um, so I know it's, I know it's not, um, proper to put a whole lot of text in slides, but I really wanted to have this because I think that just reading this guy, PhD uh, thesis, the abstract, can speak so much more um, than what actually I can say. So Willie, um, actually his PhD thesis was writing a tool that can basically put out um, a, a valid, in a sense that um, FFmpeg, VLC, those programs will actually be able to read it but uh, a, a file, a video file that's malicious. And if you read that video file, it can actually um, lead to um, all sorts of vulner vulnerabilities, basically, that you can um, then exploit. So very on person here, um, if the, the second paragraph says, uh, a, a video decoder ecosystem is obscure, opaque, diverse, highly privileged, largely untested, and highly exposed, which is a dangerous combination. So they introduced this tool, H264, which is a domain-specific infrastructure, i.e. a program for analyzing, generating, and manipulating synthetically correct, but semantically spec, non-compliant um, video files. So using this tool, we uncover insecurity and depth across the video decoding ecosystem, including kernel memory corruption bugs in iOS, memory corruption bugs in Firefox, VLC for Windows, and video accelerator and application processor kernel memory bugs in multiple um, Android devices. So clearly, I'm not the only person seeing that there is an issue here that needs to be solved. There's people actually, researchers, investigating and, 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 uh, um, and, and figuring out that there's a problem, right? So they had a, a case study where they created a bunch of videos, basically, and they say, in all, we identified a memory corruption vulnerability, a use after free and hardware accelerator VLC video playback, um, and security disclose of uninitialized memory of prior decoding state, accelerator memory corruption, and kernel driver memory corruption and crashes. So as I said from last year, that did not fly well with the Video for Linux uh, people because again, this layer of bindings was a problem. So in order to have a driver, you need to have a layer of bindings from the C code, from, from, like, from, video, from the Video for Linux framework that your driver can then use in Rust, right? And who's gonna maintain that? And if you change the C stuff, what happens to this binding layer? So my plan now is what if we could, um, instead of having a full driver, what if we could have Rust code for codec drivers in the kernel 
without having this binding layer at all, therefore sidestepping the entire issue. Is this possible? And turns out that that's possible if we, if we convert a few functions at a time to Rust and we carefully select, we carefully select which functions we want to convert. If we, if we um, identify a self-contained um, um, part of the kernel which exposes a very limited API and we then convert only these functions to Rust, then we do not need to have all these layers of bindings. Therefore, we sidestep the problem completely. I, hopefully this makes sense. And the reason why I'm here today is I, I, I want people to give me feedback on whether they basically dislike this, whether they see any sort of issues. I'll, I'll be talking more about what this approach is and whether you know, they see any obstacles in general, not only in, in Video for Linux in particular, because I may have overseen something. So feedback is always welcome. So I'll, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about the actual implementation of this. Um, how do we do what I just said? How we convert just a few functions to Rust such that we do not have this layer of bindings? This call me from C function um, is a Rust function, and the only difference from a regular Rust function is that it's annotated with two extra um, syntactic elements, one of which being the nomingle directive on top, and the other one being the extern C that comes before the function token. And basically what this means is it tells the Rust compiler to generate machine code that can be uh, call, called from C. So in the object code, you basically will have a symbol with the machine code for a function. And once that machine code is there, there's no telling where it came from, right? There's no telling whether it came from a Rust compiler or from a C compiler. That's just machine code. And it's using the C calling convention. Therefore, any other C code can call it. And if you put that, um, that machine code um, in the kernel, it turns out that the linker will actually link against your function. And at runtime, um, you will have a switch from C into Rust. Again, hopefully this makes sense. If that doesn't make sense, please um, ask. But in general, it's a function like any other function. Uh, so in, at runtime, you basically switch from, from C to Rust transparently. So we have to have this no mingle thing on top because we have to be able to name the symbol, right? So Rust actually uses the, the, the name of the symbol much like C++ does to encode a bunch of things. So generics, namespaces, um, closures, all these kinds of things, they use the, the name of the symbol to, to be encoded. And this is a problem, obviously, because you cannot call that function from C, right? Because it has a bunch of extra information. So you have to disable mangling, which means we lose access to generics and et cetera, et cetera, which is not a problem because C also does not have, does not understand generics and et cetera. So we're not losing anything. And we need this to be callable from C, hence the extern C um, 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 token. So that's it. If you do that at runtime, you call this function, you will transparently switch from Rust, uh, I'm sorry, from C into Rust. And the whole plan is, again, to identify a self-contained component, let's say a small kernel library or something along these lines that exposes only a few functions that you can just convert into Rust. That's the idea. And uh, we need to expose this new API um, to C somehow, right? Because as I said, the, the Rust compiler will generate the machine code. So far, so good. But just like C, you also need, um, in, in the same sense that C needs a header file, right, with the function um, declaration so that you can call a function, um, you also need a, 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 a header file um, that you can pound include into your, into your C code so that you can call the function that has been compiled by the Rust compiler, okay? And you can handwrite this, um, this header file if you want to. So for this very trivial function, well, it's trivial, right? You can just say like void and call me from C and that, that'll just work. But that's only for like extremely trivial stuff because as soon as you have anything more complicated that you have to hand type, this can get pretty nasty pretty badly because now you can mess with your type ABI, you can make mistakes and this will be, this can get out of sync and this can get very hard for you to debug. And the good thing about this is that there's a tool. Right? And this tool is C Bindgen. 
And CBindgen is wildly used for Firefox. It's actually something that Mozilla came up with to, work, to use on Firefox, on Servo. So it's maintained by Mozilla, and we can use that just fine. Uh, we can probably incorporate that when building the kernel to just run this tool, and it's act actively maintained. So the idea is that CBindgen will um, take all of your um, Rust function signatures and convert that to a header file that you can then pound include in, in, in the C code and use that to call into Rust. Again, hopefully that's, that makes sense, right? So let's go back a little bit. First, we identified functions that we wanted to convert. Then we, we um, write Rust code for that. We, we push this new uh, function signature with no mingle and extern C. We run this um, C bindgen tool. We get a header file. We pound include this header file into our C code that we want to, to, to call Rust from. The, the Rust compiler will generate the machine code. The linker will link that. And at runtime, you get a, a transition. That's the, the entire process. Notice how I did not say bindings at any point whatsoever. So if your function takes arguments, so let's say your function takes a pointer to a struct, or takes a struct, or an enum, CBindgen will also convert that and, and generate a Rust equivalent, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a C equivalent version. And this works because we can instruct the Rust compiler to generate types that adhere to the, to the C layout. Like using this rep C um, 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 annotation, you can basically tell Rust C to, hey, every time you see a struct, please lay out the, the members of the struct exactly as a, as a C compiler would. And this is what makes it possible to interoperate between uh, C structs and Rust structs, this, this, this rep C annotation, basically. And you probably include the header, and that's it. So. For potential targets for conversion in, in, in video for Linux, again, I said this has to be a self-contained component that exposes, hopefully, a small public API. And now for video for Linux in particular, this means like codec libraries. And for those of you who do not know what codec libraries are, uh, whenever you're writing a, a codec driver, most of the work will be offloaded to the accelerator, right? But some work still has to be performed by the CPU. And we, we, event, we essentially did not want each and every driver having this, the, CP, the, 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 the code that's running on the CPU. We did not want drivers to roll out their own code, their own functions, right? Because this comes from the spec for, for the codec. So we basically um, had one implementation in, in a library, and then all codec drivers basically call into this, into this library implementation. So these libraries with a few functions, a few codecs related functions that run on the CPU, it's these libraries that I want to start converting to Rust, basically. And why? Because they expose a very small public API, basically. And they're very self-contained. They do not touch any other part of the kernel. It's just data in, some processing, and data out. Doesn't touch other parts of video for Linux or the rest of the framework or other parts of the kernel, basically. So I think these are a good, these are, this is a good candidate, basically. Um, so basically, I, I have a proof of concept where I, I took this VP9 library, so the library for the VP9 codecs, which are used for, for some VP9 codec drivers. Uh, I'm sorry, for all VP9 codec drivers in the kernel. And I, I, I wrote a Rust version for, for that. And the thing is, we have a tool. We call it a Fluster. And Fluster is basically a, a Python script that automates two things. First, it runs a, the canonical implementation for the codec. So like for VP9, that's libvpx. So libvpx will take a, a VP9 video file and decode that using the CPU, right? Then it will run basically your hardware decoder and also get a, a, video, a, a decoded file back. And then it will compare bit by bit, like the two files, and see whether they match. And to the extent that these two files do not match, the, the, the file from libvpx and the file from the hardware accelerator, if they do not match, you have a failure. That's basically how it works. Because the libvpx for, v, for VP9 is the canonical implementation. So we have this testing tool. I used this testing tool both for the C version and for the Rust version, and I had zero regressions. I had the exact same results for both versions, proving that this works. 
And by the way, if, if I get the same score using this tool, as I've been working with this for a little bit, I'm, I'm actually confident that it will perform just the same for any VP9 video, you know? That's because I really trust, I really trust this, 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 this Fluster tool and this testing process using the canonical implementation. And it was basically a relatively uh, pain-free process. So to wrap it up, I, I, I met with the Video for Linux maintainers Monday, actually. And my proposal was this, to merge the code, actually, and, and gate that behind the kconfig, such that you can choose on whether you want the Rust implementation or the C implementation. And we could uh, run the, the Rust implementation on some CI using this Fluster testing tool I talked about to check whether we have any regressions in the future, which again, I don't really think is going to happen because otherwise we would have caught it in the first place when we run Fluster for the first time. So that's, that's the, the idea. Hopefully if that doesn't, if we do not get any regressions, we can hopefully deprecate the C version um, later on. So um, just to update you guys, uh, last time I talked to Mauro, Mauro said he was fine. Also Hans said they were fine with uh, merging that into staging. So this is good. This is more progress than what I had last year. Um, and, and the idea is that we have all these um, CI in initiatives going on for, for, for in the kernel in general and also for beautiful Linux, this media CI stuff. And the idea was to well, let's, let's try and test that using some CI and see um, uh, where we go from there. That's the latest updates. So my question is, does anybody hate this? This is your turn to basically <laughs> complain. <laughs> hey, how's it going? Um, great talk. Uh, I actually really appreciate that you're extending the olive branch to C developers, kind of giving them, um, you know, what they're used to. Uh, my one, I, more of a question than a suggestion. I think this is great. I don't hate it at all. Um, more of a suggestion. Uh, so C developers need headers. Uh, Bindgen is more of a dynamic thing. So I'm wondering if it makes sense to have the C headers um, run Bindgen and then just do some basic verification that the data structures haven't changed between the static C header versus the generated one. And that way developers know that they're still interfacing with the same calls using the same structures and that sort of thing. I, I did that, by the way. Oh, you did? Okay. For, for, for my um, proof of concept, I actually went line by line. But actually, if that wasn't the case, it would have broken Firefox and a whole lot of other softwares out there. Absolutely. I'm just thinking, uh, like, you know, for commit by commit sort of check ins type and that sort of thing. But uh, that's very really good. Thanks a lot. Any other questions? Yeah, just to follow up there, I think it's a brilliant idea. Um, you know, definitely think this is a kinder way in given, you know, bindings are the, the really nastiest part of Rust to be dealing with as a, a new developer. Um, echoing, basically, it would be really nice to have the C header visible to all of the tools that deal with C headers rather than, you know, just being a generated part of the build process, or if it's a generated part of the build process, make sure that um, things like the generated C header can still get pushed through the um, kernel doc process, so you can generate C kernel documentation for it. Um, have it be something that you know a C developer doesn't need to wait and do a build before they can see that header to use it as documentation. Makes sense. Makes total sense. Okay. Yeah, so the proposal uh, suggests to uh, have two implementations in upstream for a while. Uh, and to deprecate simple implementation, we would need to uh, have all architectures to support Rust, right? So, but it, take, it can take indefinitely long. Is it a problem? So yes, this, I, I was actually asked that by Mauro and other people. So. Yes, I, I think the uh, so 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 we have like GCC is actually working on this and and and, and but for now I don't think we support all, all architectures, right, uh, Miguel? Yeah, it, it, for, for deprecating uh, uh, C code that everybody uses, uh, we we still have some some time ahead. Uh, I mean, we have the 
GCC Rust is coming along, uh, but that will take uh, a few years still, I think. We have uh, the, the GCC backend on Rust C. That already compiles the vanilla kernel, you know, without changes. Uh, so that could be an option, but it's experimental still. Uh, there is people using the GCC side, sorry, the C side of the kernel compiled with GCC, and then compile the, the Rust C with, with the LLVM backend. That works. We don't really. We, we, we did it as a proof of concept, but people apparently like it and, and they use it. Uh, so we will see. Uh, but yes, to remove actual C code, it is still will uh, take a while. We cannot just remove C code that, every, that somebody is using so far. I don't, I don't think there's too many people running codecs on M68K or any of those crappy architectures. So I think this area is probably not applicable. Like the architecture thing is a bit of a scary thing, but it's not real. The amount of people that run code, we're not going in. Like if you're rewriting the core kernel, that might matter. But for this, it doesn't matter at all. Um, but I have a question. Did you consider writing a driver without doing, without ever saying the word binding to anyone, and just writing a bunch? Like we, we've considered this a couple of times, and writing just the C chunks of the interface, like and using that, you know, like so when you have like a, a struct with all the function pointers in it, just doing that bit in C, and then having all the function pointers be Rust things. I know you don't get the full advantage of Rust, but it gets. Like, I also think it, it's a good way of scaring. Because they, they still have to refactor things then, but you're still using the C API, so they don't have the excuse about the refactoring thing. But if they actually look at the code, they would still have to change Rust code. But I, I just wonder if psychologically whether it would have a difference than having these bindings that they have to commit to. It's just one driver that does all of it with inside the C interfaces. So the driver is still in C, and then you pipe everything to Rust, basically. Yes. Yeah, so you have like the, the, the you you have C interfaces for all of the driver entry points. I see. And then the rest of it's in Rust. That's eventually where I want to get. Like this is this is something I, I may look into. Like this this is a little bit like what you're saying, actually. You know. So so long as the part that actually transfers all this data to the hardware, like the data you used to program the hardware registers and everything. So long as this is in Rust, I think this is the core of everything. You know. If we can get that in Rust, I'd be way more quieter because that would solve a whole lot of the safety issues. Cool. Hi, Alice. Yeah, so, I mean, when you want to do this kind of thing, there are some areas, like, you don't want your Rust code to be littered with calls into C. If you're doing that, then you're giving up most of the advantages. But it is possible to do this, and I, I do this in Binder. We have Binder FS and C, and then Rust is, uh, has this uh, C interface that it exposes, where I define a file operations constant. And then I have a bunch of Rust functions that take a bunch of raw pointers, and then they call into the real code. So you can do this. Um, j just be careful to not um, put C calls all over the place, right? Because I really made sure that these functions that deal with the raw C pointers, like they immediately convert them into Rust types and then call into safe Rust. And so um, if you're careful, you can definitely do that. Um, <laughs> I, <clears throat> I just had a, a simple question about your um, path into the kernel on this. It, it sounded like you briefly mentioned you were planning on putting this into staging. Uh, is the plan to get this out of staging as quickly as possible? Um, or is this something that we want to languish in staging until we're ready to, to just flat out replace C? I mean, it's already tied behind a K config, so. Um, I, I don't think I'm, I'm in a hurry to actually move it out of staging. I, uh, my, my plan is that we go like slowly so that everybody can get used to having Rust and seeing whether everybody agrees to it. You know, I don't really, I don't really have a reason to, to push through this like as, as fast as possible because I know this is going to create some pushback actually. Yeah, I was just mainly curious, I mean as the Fedora maintainer, it's, my policy is I don't turn on staging. Um, now, there are some exceptions, but very rare. Um, just thinking if we can get it out of staging or you know, if we did a way, we've got kconfig, so we don't have to go through the staging route. Uh, but of course, I can also change my policy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, staging is the only thing I got from Auto, so that's what I have to settle for <laughs> for now. Um, hey, uh, so you spoke about. Um, uh, how uh, using bind gen works and you can call the Rust uh, functions from C. Uh, how about the other way? Uh, 
uh, calling C functions uh, from the implemented Rust uh, Rust implementations, just to check your uh, headers or kind of the opposite of what was just mentioned, um, using uh, boilerplate or framework uh, Rust uh, code to call into C and then convert that C code uh, to bring that C code into Rust one at a time. So actually, I'm I'm working on, on a driver um, for ARM GPUs, which has nothing to do with this presentation, and that's what we're doing. Basically, we have a tiny um, driver in Rust, and we pipe everything to C, right. and then we convert a little bit at a time. Know that everything is a little bit experimental, right? The, the Rust for Linux is, uh, initiative is like, I think, only four years or something. So everything, we're, at least we're trying this that I know of. Um, I think Nova and Panthor and these drivers are the first drivers trying this. That I know, but I may be okay. mistaken. But it works. It so, works. So that's a good stepping stone as well. Yes. All right, thanks. I have a simple question. You mentioned that there is no degradation, but yes. any hope to improve performance? I think this question goes much beyond the video for Linux, and, and it, it, it's a question about whether Rust is as performant as C. And this is this goes like beyond what I did, right? This is something for the Rust committee and other people to 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 to. But I I do not know the answer really. Maybe Miguel can can shed light. Yeah, I see the point, but it's very convincing to have improvement for guys that use codex or something. What I can tell you for sure is that there's no overhead versus calling a C function. It's so we have the null block driver and an NVMe driver written in Rust, and there are performance regression tests available on the Rust for Linux website. There you can go and see how at least we do it in the block layer. The, the Rust implementations are half a percent slower than the C implementation as um, uh, when it comes to throughput IOPS. Um, I think um, uh, looking at performance may be the wrong yardstick in some ways, just because I think C code is heavily optimized anyway, and there's probably no more performance benefit you can get from changing the language or changing something else. The real measure here might be the safety and the security that you're getting. And, and so if you want to measure that, measure that. Like bugs over time, CVs over time. Performance might already be optimal today, so. <laughs> yeah, just on the, um, uh, what we were just talking about, on, on the performance. I was, I was actually wondering if you found if you think you did all of these libraries, would you find any bugs in the C code? Do you think there is any memory safety issues in there, or do you think the testing tool that you have has probably already caught all of the memory safety issues in the C code? Or like as you've implemented more Rust across this, do you think you'll start to see there might be some memory safety issues in the C side? Wait, so the question is whether I think there's there's issues in the C side? Yeah, whether, whether you think you, you know, you've done one or two, you said, but you think, do you think there's any that might be in some of these libraries that are already pre-existing that you might fix doing this? I actually discussed this with Mauro and Hans and the other people because they told me, hey, you're changing something that works for something that works. What's the point here, right? And like, how can you be sure that the thing we started with actually works? That there's no bugs, you know? Because if you knew there was a bug, you would have fixed that. Isn't that like logical? So by the very definition, if there's any vulnerabilities there, you do not know about them. Otherwise, you would have fixed them. So. I, I, I believe we can probably be fixing um, on things as we go. One of the things they wanted me to do was basically, hey, if you can run this H.264 stuff that you, you brought, like this research thing, and you can prove that you can craft a malicious file and it crashes the kernel and your Rust code prevents this crash, you're going to gain more, 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 more points with us. That they, they told me this. So I, I may look into doing this this year. Um, So at, at least statistically, there are vulnerabilities in the C implementation. We have some, um, uh, there are some slides around <coughs> listing different statistics on this matter. And uh, the question that remains to be seen is if these uh, issues disappear in the Rust code base. And I believe Google has published some uh, stats on that on their uh, security blog. And at least the empirical data that they have show that the, the 
bugs actually do disappear in Rust code bases. But I guess it remains to be seen like how it turns out. Okay. Thank you, Daniel.